This is Shrimp. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Um, so apologies a little bit to anybody that saw my talk at Python user group. This is mostly the same. There's some new bits. So you will get something different, but you might have to be bored for the first part. So if you don't know me from before, either the Python talk or from the Lightning talks, I'm Shrimp. I'm a data scientist. I kind of from all over the place, which is why my accent's very confused. Um, you can ask me more later about where that is from. Um, so what I'm talking about today is how I've been looking at walkability in Wellington, and something that's quite interesting for me, particularly since I've just come back after about four years in the UK, where I lived in East Anglia, which if you don't know, is Pancake Flat, and um, it drove me insane. And then I came back home and I was like, oh wow, it's great walking here, it's hilly, it's wonderful. Um, but then, you know, that throws up a lot of questions. How walkable is a hilly topography? And that's something that I'll be trying to, to cover today via some modeling. So what can you expect? Um, I don't think we usually have data science-y type talks at WASAT, unless I'm very much mistaken. Um, so maybe something new for people. Um, introduction, how to do a little bit of spatial data science. What are the key components of it? a little introduction to statistical modeling and why it's useful and what you can learn, and, um, and how both those things actually tell you a little bit about how walkable Wellington is as a city. And all of this is done by lots of graphs and figures, so there's not really very much technical content. There's no code, which I actually got rid of some of the Python code from my last talk, so there's no code to look at. Kind of good. Um, right, so motivation, um, other than what I just said before, I'm quite sort of keen on open data, open source, and something that's recently come into my radar is the uh, FOS4G movement, which is just free and open source software for sort of geospatial stuff. And there's a lot of great things there from data sources like OpenStreetMap, and then a lot of the spatial data source, spatial data that comes out from the various data.gov initiatives around the world. So we have a great one here in New Zealand, um, but you know, you've got the UK one, you've got the US and so on. And then also a whole host of different types of packages that allow you to do spatial um, analysis on whatever language um, that you're comfortable with. Or if you're not wanting to do anything code-based, um, code you can use QGIS. That's the sort of free and open source version of ArcGIS, Esri stuff, which you pay lots of money for, but QGIS is free. Um, so yeah, so these are just some of the, some of the open source packages that do spatial um, analysis. There's a lot more that I'm just not talking about here. Um, so it's a very, very exciting place to be in. It's, I think, relatively new in the sense that it, you know, it's really been only going on for the last few years. There's an annual FOS4G conference, which was in Dar es Salaam last year, which is great. I wish I could have gone, um, but I didn't. Anyway, so the other part of why spatial analysis is really interesting is there's some people doing some really, really interesting work sort of in the public domain. They publish the stuff as blog posts. Um, and this guy, Quinn Butts, he um, is a urban planner and he does, he works for a, a company that does a lot of this stuff, urban planning and spatial sort of analysis. But he publishes a lot of interesting work, including things like modeling what happens when you've got um, critical infrastructure that breaks down. So what, do, what actually happens? So this is him taking, that's the street network and actually modeling critical pathways. And as you go down, he's sort of seeing the impact of what happens when, you know, sort of key bits of it sort of break down. What's the impact of that? Um, that's actually a hyperlink, so you could potentially follow it to his website and read the, um, read the post. There's people like Jeff Boeing, who um, not only is a researcher in geospatial stuff, but he also does, um, he also develops the OSM NX package, which I'll be talking about. I've used that quite heavily. But this is really cool. This is him analyzing these street networks of cities all over the world and actually plotting their orientations. And you can see, you know, some streets like Beijing are, are sort of very sort of grid-like and others are really random like London um, with just a little bit of orientation skewing. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's quite interesting. He does a lot more around urban morphologies using street networks. And then there's people like Robin Loveless, who's up in Leeds, I believe, um, and he He's again a big sort of open source um, person and he's been doing a lot of modeling in particular um, with councils. And this particular one is uh, around the propensity of people to cycle around Leeds. And he's sort of looking at where do people come from, where do they go to? But he's also examining different scenarios about you know, 
what, how can you make people cycle more and what sort of impact they have. So it's really great stuff. And it's, um, yeah, it's published, you can read it for free, the paper, and I think you can play with this tool as well online. But yeah, so I kind of showed those specific examples because they were really quite um, motivating to me and I sort of cobbled together aspects of them to do my own analysis on walkability. So taking elements of street networks, taking elements of sort of modeling um, routes through things, and then taking elements of the sort of statistical side um, to hopefully understand a little bit more about how walkable Wellington is. And so there's a sort of technical side of things, but obviously um, having a walkable city is quite an important thing just generally. A lot of um, movements around the world, particularly at the council level, are really, really trying to get people to use active transport. That's either walking or cycling or scooting, whatever, just not driving. So that, you know, you actually go outside, you get your exercise, you get fit, um, while you also do the things that you need to do every day, like get your groceries or get to work. So this is quite a nice one where um, there's a sort of a document looking at walkability in New Zealand cities. And they talk about how the built environment that we live in um, is really important. And that's what we'll be looking at in this analysis, getting the data of the built environment and then using that to analyze the walkability. So yeah, I mean, it's obvious to everybody that, <laughs> you know, to, to do something actively, either it's cycling or walking, you actually, there's a lot of things around the environment that will um, affect your experience and you know, if it's really rainy, you might not enjoy your walking experience. Or if it's very hilly, um, you might not either, especially if you're somebody who's carrying a pack or um, you've got young children. You know, all of these things will affect your decision to whether you walk or not. And so they have to really be taken um, in the context of how walkable your sort of nearby environment and therefore, and, and the greater environment is, if you want people to do more active transport in their lives. So this is our task. We're going to be examining the impact of hilly terrain on walkability. And the way I've done it is looking at walkability to council playgrounds. And there's a reason for that. So you can sort of approximate walkability through an accessibility metric. And um, why we do that is most people actually access um, council playgrounds, um, the nearest council playground, and a good number of them access it on foot. A lot of them also access it by car, which is annoying. That's probably why, um, that's why, um, be too hilly for them, I suspect, but nobody has actually asked them that question. But anyway, so this is why sort of looking at council playgrounds can be a good proxy for um, looking at local accessibility in Wellington. So now you can start doing some data science, and this is how you do it. Lots of fun circles. Um, the central part is a question, so you need to be really clear about what you're actually doing, and we'll sort of get to that next. And there's this whole thing about then describing your space, abstracting it, getting your data from the abstraction. Oops. Sorry. And then you've got the sort of statistical model part, which we'll go through, and then you've got a whole bunch of insights that will hopefully then tell you a little bit more about the question that you're actually interested in. This is the question. <laughs> it's rephrasing it so that nobody forgets. What's the impact of hills on walkability to playgrounds in Wellington? And the space is obviously Wellington. I've been quite um, careful in choosing just the, the, the Wellington city. Um, no lower hut, no Porirua here, sorry. Um, and then you start getting into the abstraction. And this is where it's really interesting, sort of need to know a little bit about um, spatial um, data and spatial objects to, to kind of do anything with them. So brief introduction to what spatial primitives are. These are a whole bunch of points. They're the locations of playgrounds. And that's the sort of the most simple spatial primitive that you can have is just a point. It's got a coordinate, usually latitude, longitude, but you can have other coordinate systems as well like easting and northing and so on. Then you have a line segment. That's a sort of next level up in terms of spatial geometry. So this is a little section in Johnsonville. It's um, a map. And this sort of red line here is a route between two points. And that's a line geometry. Um, you can also have lines that define streets. You can have um, lines that can draw any sort of arbitrary um, sort of spatial route. And then the more complex ones are polygons, which are enclosed lines. So this is the polygon for Karori. Um, people may recognize it. That's Zealandia over here. Um, and so, you know, you build up from a point 
to a line, which is a series of points. You then build up to an enclosed line, which is a polygon. So those are the three simple spatial primitives. You can also have um, more complex abstractions where you can put in um, sort of polygons on top of polygons, and they tend to be very, very useful, and you can do lots of operations when you start munging spatial primitives together effectively. So this is the um, mesh block. Um, people are familiar with mesh block um, spatial units. Um, it's the smallest unit that the census uses. Um, and that's sort of superimposed on top of the Karori suburb boundary. So yeah, so you've got the sort of basic spatial primitives and these are um, really nice because we sort of instantly recognize them. But another nice abstraction is converting um, maps to graph structures. And for people who aren't familiar with a graph, it's really simple, um, this kind of graph, or a network, as some people call it. Um, you have a lot of nodes that are connected um, via edges. And there's different terminologies for them. You can call the nodes vertices, and you can call the edges links. It just depends on who's talking. And the nice thing about graphs is that you can have attributes associated with the nodes. The nodes can have a, a name. Um, the edges could have a name. Um, and they can have values, the nodes can have a size. Um, say it could be, uh, this could be a network of cities connected by rail, and the, the nodes could have a size of how big that city potentially is. So there's a lot of different representations you can do with graphs, and that's really great. Um, and one of the, the main ways that I'm using it is by converting a map into a street network. And so what you have here are edges, which are the street segments, and the nodes are the intersections. So if you imagine um, the nice little intersection between um, Manor Street and Willis Street that everybody would have walked on, that would be a, a node. And the bits from, from that node would be the bit that's going up Victorious, up Willis Street, up Bullcott Street, down Willis Street, and then down Manor Street. Does that make sense to people? Yeah. It's a relatively simple abstraction, but it's very, very powerful in what it actually allows you to be able to do. And we'll see that later. So the nice thing about all of these spatial primitives, especially if you're using tools like R and Python, is that you can just pull them down into basic um, data frames. And so here you've got a polygon geometry for Karori. And that's just the polygon. It's just squidged in a single column. And you've got all the other attributes associated with that polygon in um, various other columns. So it's very, very easy to work with spatial data and the same with graphs. So the same data frame can be used to represent a graph. So this is the node part of the data frame. So you've got a node ID, um, a bunch of metadata associated with it that comes from um, OSM, OpenStreetMap. And then you've got a sort of X and Y coordinate for, for that node. And then that's also converted into a sort of a spatial geometry that's used by, um, by GeoPandas in this case. And for an edge, you have the node that it comes from and the node that it goes to. And as I said, you can have associated metadata. This is the name of that street. You also have the street grade, so the, the inclination of the street. You have how long that particular segment is. Because remember, because we've made intersections nodes, a street can be broken up into multiple edges, multiple segments that will have a length. So you'll see many values for Truscott Avenue, for example. And then OSM um, also gives you the speed, the driving speed of, the, of that particular segment. There's a lot of other metadata that you can use to enrich. I just sort of selected a few that people would be familiar with. <coughs> so that now allows us to put together all the data that we need to look at walkability in Wellington. So we have a street graph. We got the street graph for Wellington. We got council playgrounds. They're represented as points. We've got suburb boundaries, because one of the things I was really interested in is local walkability at the suburban level. It's a sort of spatial unit most people are comfortable with. If you say, where do you live? Oh, I live in Crory. I live in Northland, or I live in Kelvin. So it's, it's sort of, it's known to people as somewhere, oh, I can check what the walkability is like in Kelvin versus, say, Nio. So that was one of the key reasons for sort of going down to a suburban level rather than anything smaller. Um, and the final thing, I use is um, the Linz residential polygons to actually say, this is where people live within a suburb. I don't care about anything else. And that's quite useful. Cool. I still got to do some more stuff with data. 
But this is the cool stuff. Um, so we have all of our primitive data. So we've reduced our map to a street network. And, um, but that's not really the full story. We still need to be able to say, what is walkability? Like, how do you measure it? And one of the ways that um, I've sort of simplified it to, and there's a, it's a very much a simplification, is saying walkability is just kind of how long it takes you to get somewhere. Um, there's a lot of other aspects, like how good the roads are, whether the footpaths are just on one side, you have to keep crisscrossing, um, which you do in some parts of Wellington. Um, but this is a very sort of simple objective metric that you can reduce your spatial data to. So it just says from any point on a, from any street, how long does it take me or how far is my nearest playground? And that's literally it. It's a very, very simple reduction of spatial data. So this is how it works. You start with a very simplistic street grid. That's your playground. And then you basically just look at how far um, all the other points are on the streets, the other nodes are to that particular um, playground. And so you end up with this sort of heat map, if you will. And that's all there is really to accessibility. Um, with the street networks, it goes one step further. You don't just do as the crow flies distance, you can actually walk along the streets. And this is where it's really useful um, to have um, a graph because algorithms that can do that are very efficient. Um, so here you can quite simply say, I want to go from this particular address to this particular address and actually traverses the road network to, to get you there. And it tells you how long, um, what distance that was. And it can also tell you if you've got um, a sensible sort of speed conversion, it can tell you how long it will take you to get there as well. So you can, if you do that efficiently for the entire street network of Wellington, get an accessibility map for playgrounds. So that's um, all the yellow spots are where there are parks. And as you get greener and bluer, you're getting further away um, from, the, from the playgrounds, sorry. That was, oops, I went the wrong way. <laughs> that was just using distance um, converted to time, travel time, using a very simple single speed. It's like I walk at exactly the same speed no matter where I am, which is patently not true because Wellington's a really hilly city. Um, and so one of the nice things about um, OSM NX is that I can pull down street gradients for you. And that's what we've got here. All the green bits are the, the really flat parts. So they're kind of around the coast. Um, Miramar Peninsula, you've got the airport area. It's all really flat. And you can see that in the, um, in the graph on your right, which, oh, yep. The directionality, no, it kind of gives no, you. Yeah. It just kind of, I think, gives you an average one. It just takes the the elevation of one node and the other, and then takes the difference in elevation. So yeah, if you've got local variability between the nodes, so it tends to be bad. So if you've got a really long street, it will approximate the elevation very poorly. Good point. Um, so yeah, so you can use this enriched data for the edges to then say, okay, I assume a single speed no matter what the gradient is, and then you can use the gradient and you can convert it to a more sensible speed. There are a bunch of um, gradient to speed um, functions that you can use. They're not great, but they're something. So you've got a slightly better um, accessibility heat map that you cannot tell the difference between until you do something like an actual difference between the two. And you can start to see that all the areas that were flat, sort of the, the sort of central Wellington, the coastal areas, Miramar Peninsula, they all go away because there's no difference, there's no hill. So it takes you exactly the same amount of time. And you start to see sort of Kandala, sort of bits around Northland, Kelvin coming in. So that's cool. You can also pull out this data and that's the raw accessibility values. And now you can overlay suburban boundaries and say, I only care about the accessibility in, say, Newlands or Hatai or Brooklyn and so on. So you can start using um, polygons as filters over, over your accessibility map. Does that make sense to people? Questions? No? Yes. Okay. Yes. That is total travel time. Yeah, so I should have mentioned that. That's one of the weird quirks about the the lack of 
directionality when you traverse the graph that it's kind of doesn't really tell you you're going from your house to the playground. It just calculates one way. So you to get the full impact of the hills, you have to do a, a going and coming back. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, it's in minutes. Yeah, apologies, lack of units. Um, so yeah, so. So, talking about knowledge, um, so these are the two questions that I tried to ask. They're quite simple. Saying, what's the average accessibility within the suburb? And saying, well, how much variability is there because of the suburb as well? Because you kind of want to know, okay, typically how long does it take you to get to a playground, but how does it vary for other people who live in different parts of the suburb? And um, you can do that because you can take out the accessibility data and you can actually fit a distribution to it. And I'm probably not going to go through that in too much detail. You can talk to me later if you want. But it's quite simply just a variation of the normal distribution because you can't have really accessible people if you have a suburb at the edge. And you can do all of the computations with a lovely tool called SPAN. Um, it's got an interface to type in called PyScan. Um, and that will just um, basically sample your average or your, or your um, cinema for you. Again, more details. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. It's all kind of that, right, the relative comparison is still valid. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, it just gives you a, a very um, a higher level, um, you know, lower end for the, the length of travel time because it's faster than you might actually, actually do. So therefore, in a way, it's not really realistic of how <coughs> the council envisioned its sort of placeholder design and then what it really is, um, which is what I'm trying to get to, make it more realistic. 
plus the six increase. Mhm. Okay. Yeah. Here you are, sweet. Uh, you are the Yoda. You can you already bent your master, so you just can take the set of small or you 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 look at them. Wait, did you say that you relied on polygons or is that just how you design these? Yeah. Yeah, it's just the main polygon residential polygon. But then you want to know if there is a house there. Maybe the size of the house, so that's really skewing the the number of people living there. Or you can have like, a gate. No, 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 it's like there's a house. Oh yeah, okay. That would be cool. If it's just like a mosque or a mm- I don't think that counts. Like a mosque, yeah. Um, so this blue is just the it's always residential polygon, and all it does is only takes the accessibility um, well, it takes only the streets within that area and the accessibility values within that area. All of these ones which are kind of not part of that residential polygon are completely red. So the the filtered data set is a lot cleaner to use. Mm. Yeah. So the 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 points there are just <laughs> points along the road or are they Yeah, so they're points at the edge. Intersection. Yeah. At the edge of the street and what yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's not that fine grained really, especially if you've got multiple people who live there. Yeah, the the reason I was going to ask is whether you had any interest, has anybody from the council noticed? (laughs) Has anybody (laughs) asked you about it? No. (laughs) It's not bad, it just probably helps when I have a beach. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. Um, So because you've got polygons that are constraining probably where you're going to get to the council play area, um, does the model, is the model able to account for an instance where you're on the edge of a suburb with a polygon? Yeah, it does, it does. So the polygons... And you can cross over? Yeah, the polygons do not do anything with the accessibility, okay. that's on the whole city. Excellent. Yeah, precisely for that reason that your nearest playground might be in the next suburb yeah. over, and yeah. you don't want to mm-hmm. get rid of that. Like if you're, if you're in Island Bay, you might Absolutely, go to, yeah. you're in Port Hamilton, you might go to yeah. the park there. Yeah, 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 exactly. All of the suburban residential stuff comes after the city of Port Hamilton. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, I, th- I think it's really funny that the two most walkable suburbs in Wellington are the two that are literally named after the hills that they're on, right? <laughs> and, so, and so I'd love to know why. Like, um, my, my first guess is that, the, is that the Mount Vic suburb doesn't include the really hilly parts. It's sort of the flat and starting to go up the hill because up there you've got, what, Roseneath and, and, yeah, and, and the higher yeah. bits. Yeah. bits and, and, and Mount Cook is it's not actually named after a hill. It's, it's named after Mount Cook, which is not in Wellington, not right? So yeah. That that like, hill is actually called Cook, isn't it? Hill hill off to post Cook and then <laughs> 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 it's just not a very big mountain. <laughs> but yeah, like I, I can't help but wonder why there's that weird idiosyncrasy in the results, yeah. right? And so maybe it's because Mount Cook is, is situated yeah. with like parks all around it because it's near the town belt and stuff, and maybe Mount Vic is largely flat because everything high up the hill is called a different yeah. suburb. You're gonna remember Mount Vic was the slot. Everything high up the hill doesn't have houses. Like, like,
background. Yeah. Obviously, this is sort of a toy project in, in a lot of ways, but what piece of evidence could you go and look at and go, actually, hey, wait a minute. I've missed some important detail here because so and so a suburb actually is kind of crap. Or like. So you, but your hunch was just, wait, Newtown must not be that bad. And then you, 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 yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, um, okay. yeah. And um, in terms of other ways of chalking it, so the council has an idea. Um, it's trying to put on um, playgrounds every 600 or 800 meters. And that kind of broadly comes out of the accessibility analysis I just showed here. But when you look at the distance distribution for the city meters, it's around 700. Thank you. 